Welcome to our Serious Play for Innovation co-creation webinar. Here we will explore how Serious Play methods such as Lego Serious Play can energize participation and fuel breakthroughs in design thinking initiatives. My name is Angela Koch. I am founder of In Vitro Innovation. I'm based in Singapore. I was originally from the advertising industry. This is what brought me to Asia. But about 10 years ago, I started my own innovation consulting firm, In Vitro Innovation, and I've been passionate about driving participation in innovation and using human-centered design methods along the way. Lego Series Play is a key part of my practice, and I'm a certified facilitator. My co-facilitator, Darwin, is also a Lego Series Play certified facilitator. Darwin brings 25 years of corporate experience in marketing and technology, and he is working in areas such as mashing up service design, serious play, and visual thinking. Our agenda today is a simple one. I'll kick things off with an introduction to serious play and how it can contribute to innovation with a specific focus on Lego serious play. We'll conduct a short simulation to see how Lego serious play can contribute to the design thinking process. Darwin will then take things forward by looking at some of the other serious play methods and how they can also impact the design thinking process. We'll have a panel discussion and we'll close the session with Paul Selvaraj from Design Singapore sharing on the Design Singapore programs. So this is just a little sort of open a question for everybody and it should be appearing on your smartphone. Um, and it basically says, which brick speaks to you? So just pick one which you think is speaking to you right now. And then I will pull up the result to see where we all stand. Okay, and you can see people are putting their inputs in. A um, couple of bricks there. Uh, we've got a couple of plants doing super well. Um, but the red window is charging ahead as well. Um, and of course, our little vehicle with the wheels is, is coming along as well. So just a little, little exercise to say to you guys, you know, even uh, something as simple as a brick can actually connote uh, some thoughts and feelings, can even give you a sense of how you're feeling right now. Um, and just again, just to sort of practice this using of Mentimeter, um, I thought we would then ask you one more question with re relation to these bricks. Um, and it is, what is it saying to you? So I, in a, in a perfect world, I could ask about all nine or so of these bricks, but we don't have time. So I'm going to just pull up one and say, what is the red window saying to you? And I'd like you to just put in a couple words into the next slide. You should be instructed to push along to the next question and just put in a couple thoughts and let's see. What is the red window saying? And a word cloud of inputs, I can see lots of things coming through. Opportunity seems big. Perspective, openness, um, window to the world, and so forth and so forth. And you can see as more um, inputs are coming in, that, that word cloud is getting a bit crazy there. But basically, I think uh, the message I have for you is that something as simple as a Lego brick can actually have meaning, right? And obviously, a window has a lot of um, metaphorical elements to it. And of course, later when we do the Lego Series Play session, you'll see that these bricks actually do have meaning. They, they provoke certain thoughts in people. Um, and we're really just tapping into that for our Series Play session. So I'll leave that one for now. And to let's check where we're all coming from. Of course, this is a session on uh, serious play as well as design thinking and how we can sort of bring these two together. Um, and I had a couple of questions. I want to know what you guys, what's your relationship with these two topics? How much uh, familiarity do you have? And that'll just give us a sense of where we stand. Um, and if I just give me a sec, I want to go on to the next one. So first question is about design thinking. So what is your experience with design thinking? And I really just want you to choose one response. And let's see 
uh, where we where we lie, the options being no knowledge, um, some knowledge, never heard of this thing. Maybe you've even participated in a design thinking project, maybe you received some training. Um, you might even be a expert in design thinking. So just interesting to see where we lie. Um, most people saying they've got some knowledge. Um, a couple haven't really heard of it. Well, hopefully we, we sort of uh, close that loop for you today. Um, some have even facilitated projects. We've got 22%, 23%. Um, have have done that so that's phenomenal uh, yeah so that's that's a good spread right um, but good that most of you have obviously heard of it uh, we're going to be using serious play and connecting it design thinking so explaining how serious play can contribute um, and we have one more question for you and this is about serious play so let's go on to this one which is what is your experience with this term serious play and again, you just select one and let's see where you guys are. So many of you, very unfamiliar, never heard of serious play. Well, we're going to definitely change that today. Uh, some knowledge. I've been trained in a serious play method. I know who that is. Um, or I've even experienced a workshop in that. So uh, that's cool. But most of you, I think, probably a bit more familiar with design thinking, a little less familiar with, with serious play. Um, and that's really helpful for us. Okay, cool. So I'm going to leave the Mentimeter for now. You can just leave it open, leave the phone off to the side, and uh, we will have a couple questions later. Um, but for now, we go back to our main session. Um, and let's talk about this play and innovation, okay? Um, so where I'm coming from is really this idea that innovation and the way in which we sort of find new opportunities has changed radically over the last sort of 10 years or so. And maybe even the sort of things have sort of come undone a little bit. And we're having to include lots more people in the conversation about what opportunities we want to go after and what, what those specific things might be. Um, and it really has required a little bit of a rethink in terms of how we work and how we discover new opportunities for our company to, to innovate. There's really just a very simple way of looking at things, which is to say, if you think about how we normally work and the world of work as we know it, it's very efficiency driven. And what I mean here is we very task oriented. We've, be, we've sort of optimized work so that we can get lots of things done in a short period of time. Um, and it's very good at exploiting opportunities that have already been discovered. And so, you know, a business model has been set up. We have figured out who our customer is, our product, and we're now exploiting that. Um, and that's really how most work has been organized. The problem is, is that we need to look for new opportunities. This requires a different kind of focus. And this is really where we want more work that's around emergence. And emergence is really about exploring and saying what can be. You know, what is, what, is, what is missing in our customer's life or what is the opportunity in our category? Um, and emergent work really requires a little bit more of sort of meandering, exploring, um, opening up the imagination. And it doesn't work in the same way as efficiency work. Um, it's hard to marshal it and say, arrive now, we have 30 minutes and now we need our next big idea. Um, it needs a little bit more time and space and the right conditions need to be set. For, um, for this work to happen. And so what, this is where we feel play has a huge opportunity that we can put people in a more creative, innovative mode and serious play is, play is one way in which we can really bring out the imagination. Uh, and so this is our focus and our interest today. So just to give you a little definition of what this is, because I see a lot of you are not familiar with the term. Um, in fact, it, it was born around 1995. And in fact, Lego were one of the early uh, originators of the term. Essentially what it means is you create a playful environment so that new ideas um, and, new, and new things can emerge. And so it's really creating that space where people feel like they're having a playful time 
they don't feel like they're doing heavy strategic or innovation work. Um, and it really allows things that normally would be inaccessible to, to emerge. Um, the term, sorry, probably came around in 95. And in year 2000, there was a book written by a guy by the name of Michael Schraj called Serious Play. Um, I've got it over here. And this was a, a really a seminal book on, on serious play. And it was around sort of how to use prototyping and, and sort of experimentation and playfulness. Um, and that was, so that's 20 years ago now that the term is, has, has really been um, with us. I would say in terms of methodologies, there are many methods that fall into serious play, but probably the most famous would be the Lego serious play method. Um, and we're gonna show a little bit about that, but we're gonna talk about some of the others um, as well. So in terms of how Lego serious play and serious play come together with design thinking, design thinking is really a phenomenal methodology. If we're going to be including a lot of people into um, innovation, it's a great way to create an accessible way for people to participate in innovation. And when you add a serious play element to it, you really just sort of take it to the max in terms of energizing people, getting people to lean in and contribute. You know, innovation can be intimidating. And when you bring serious play into the equation, you take it down to a more human level and people are, feel, hey, I can do this. You know, when you, when you bring Lego bricks into a workshop, everybody feels this is something I can do. But when you talk about strategizing, and sort of heavy innovation lifting, people feel like they can, they need to retreat from that. Um, and so serious play really in a way engages people and says, come, come play, let's, um, let's do something together. So Lego serious play being the, probably the most uh, popular and, and certainly the leading edge methodology, Darwin and myself both are Lego serious play facilitators. And effectively what this is, it's taking the Lego that we're all familiar with, that we might have played with as kids and bringing it into the boardroom, bringing it into the meeting room. Uh, Lego really pursued this because they felt at the time in the mid-90s, Lego wasn't actually doing so well, um, that their managers lacked imagination, that they weren't being uh, creative in their solutions. Um, and the thinking was, how can we bring this thing that fires up the creativity of kids and, and bring it to the world of adults. So how Lego Serious Play actually works is we, we give a question and then we ask the participants to build a model in response to that question. After that, there is some storytelling that happens about what have you built and then some reflection that happens. So um, in terms of the actual process, it takes several hours, um, maybe as short as two or three but often the workshops that Darwin and myself run might be sort of more like a day or a day and a half and, and even two days, depending on how complex the topic is. So what we're going to share with you today is very much a simulation of that process. Um, it's really to give you a flavor. Um, and of course, being virtually adds another dimension to the whole process because, you know, when you walk into a room full of bricks, people's energy changes. You know, they, they, they light up, they become sort of kids again. They know they're there to play. And so in a way, we get, we get a huge helping hand as facilitators when people walk into a room and go, ha, ah, Lego. Um, but of course, in a virtual world, it is possible to build. Um, and, and there are a couple of hacks and workarounds that we use, um, but um, obviously a slightly different uh, experience. Basically, Lego is used for any kind of communication or problem solving. So where you want people to think about an issue deeply, you want them to lean in and contribute, and really it unlocks knowledge that's sitting latent in people's brains. Okay, so you hopefully a little bit later, you're going to see exactly how, how that works. In terms of where Lego Series Play has its most benefit, um, if you think of the design thinking process, sort of following these stages of starting off with an understanding of the customer or the empathizing stage, then sort of synthesizing that into some problem understanding or problem reframe, then jumping into where can we go with this? What's the new opportunity? What's the idea? And then trying to uh, experiment around how to manifest that idea into prototype and then obviously to put that in front of customers and test. So there's uh, maybe most of you are familiar with sort of that, the, the five-step process or thereabouts. Um, 
essentially there is an emergence phase, which is at the beginning, which is sort of like trying to understand what's going on and what can be. And then later on, there's an exploitation phase. And, and certainly Lego series play is very strong in the front end of that process. So where you're trying to understand the customer, trying to understand what challenge or problem we should uh, tackle, and even generating ideas. Lego series play is very, very strong. Uh, I've never used it on the prototyping and validation side, and I'm sure maybe some people have. If you're simply using it for communication, it definitely would have some value there. But we say at the front end, at the more confusing end, um, Lego series play probably has the greatest impact. Okay. So this is something that I can talk about for days, but quite frankly, I may not give you any greater clarity on how this process really works. This is really best experienced. And I know that um, we had about 25, 30 people who registered um, for the Lego session. Um, it is difficult to do this with 100 or 150 people. Typically, we need one facilitator to about 10 people. So we thought we'd do a simulation today. Um, and for the simulation, what we're going to do is we're going to go into two breakout rooms. Darwin will manage one room. I will manage the other. Um, hopefully, for those of you that did sign up for the Lego session, you've got your Lego handy. It should be uh, hopefully sitting in front of your computer. And we're going to ask that those folks who are playing Lego clearly identify yourselves by renaming yourself in the Zoom. You can do it at the top right of your video, of your video box. I just say Lego in your name. Um, and everyone else is going to be an observer for the session. And so we ask that you turn your video off as well as your audio and sort of just hang back and observe what is going on. The session's only going to take about 20 minutes, um, so not very long. And, and we're back. <laughs> Sorry. Whoa, timing, yeah. Darwin. Awesome. Darwin. Yes. How was that? Perfect. How was that, Darwin? Oh, um, I find it uh, very different <laughs> and exciting <laughs> to be like facilitating yeah. in this way and virtual. But I, I, I'd like to hear from our participants. It's cool. Really, so I'm yeah. going to screen share, guys. Um, and let, so you should be seeing. Um, so while we were in session and Darwin and I, now normally we wouldn't multitask to this level if we're facilitating Lego <laughs> series play. Um, yeah. We would have someone else doing it next to us. But anyway, for the interests of our demo, what was happening is the participants built their models. Um, we were taking some notes on the key sort of points that they made. Um, and we also took some images of the models being built and the individual captures as well. So there's my team. We tried to, I, I, well, this was very challenging for me doing a screen grab while holding up a model and getting all of these things going, but we managed to achieve it. Mm -hmm. And basically on this question, so we had this question around when you are doing um, online shopping, particularly in a local retail sense, what is it that you want from that experience? And Darwin, maybe I'll just share a little bit that came from, um, from my guys. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of uh, mentions around the human connection. Um, looking for a happy experience, the joy of shopping. Um, maybe I could call on. Can I call on uh, Norlisa? Are you still there? Hi. Show everybody your model, Norlisa. Tell them what 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 you built. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Let's just tell us what you built and what does it mean in in the in the context of online shopping. Um, I was looking more at um, a micro experience for myself, so uh, it has. It, it started off with our tower, but it has these branches on top because um, my online shopping experience is that I'm normally focused to buy one thing, but I branch out to buy many mm -hmm. other unrelated things. But I did mm -hmm. um, try to make myself a bit more responsible and look for um, environmentally friendly things, uh, green things. So I added a little plant right on top. Yeah. Cool. Good. Well done. Good. So, look, that was a very quick process, guys. Um, yeah. It was like, you know, rapid fire um, Lego series play. <laughs> Normally, I think I think Darwin and I, we might get sort of excommunicated from the Lego series play community <laughs> for doing this so fast. Um, but don't tell anybody, okay? Don't tell anyone. Um, just, to, just to wrap up on Lego series play, what makes it powerful 
is that it gets knowledge out of people. So it's latent in people's brains, maybe not even so conscious. Um, but the bricks provoke and we, we, we sort of um, are able to elicit a response, particularly because we're dealing with metaphor. Um, also, language is so ambiguous and sometimes verbally it's hard to explain what's going on in the company or complex system. And so the, the visual can be very powerful. Um, and it's very memorable. You know, someone can present a model and even weeks later you remember what that meant and who said it and why. So that's, that's very, very powerful as well. Okay. Um, this is what a session looks like. You know, it's normally a bit more intimate. We, we like one facilitator to 10 people, um, but you can obviously have bigger groups and more facilitators. Uh, we pick the bricks, we build our models. Sometimes we write post-its. Um, and we create sometimes a shared model where we, we try to have a common understanding of what everyone feels or thinks about a particular topic. This was one I did, and I've done several for LVMH here in Asia Pacific. In terms of design thinking, um, what we can do is we can use these models to build where we would normally put a post-it on a, on a flip chart or on a poster. We can ask people to build. Um, obviously, building takes a bit longer than just writing something on a post-it. So you've got to be careful about how much Lego you can add to the process. But you could do like a journey mapper, you know, some kind of a user journey. And maybe you just build the models to identify the pain points along the journey, for example. You don't have to build the entire thing. Okay, so that's just to show you a little example of how, how we use it. Um, if you feel like you really want to uncover something that is latent, that's not really on the top of sort of people's tongues, then I think Lego really um, is very powerful in, in doing that. Angela and I um, have been utilizing uh, this design thinking in, in, our, in our practice. Um, Hers is on innovation and branding and mine in um, service and experience design. Um, what has been apparent, uh, I believe, is that we use serious play uh, to enhance the quality of the engagement with, with the team amongst the members of the team um, in going through a fairly difficult, uh, probably design thinking journey or uh, in going through the challenges. What we've done, uh, Angela and I, have identified serious play, yes, including Lego serious play, and what are the attributes that make, make, what make an activity um, categorized as a serious play. So what we've looked at is like, when an activity, um, an activity is making us build uh, and make, um, yes, it is serious play. And when we see that we, um, infuse symbolism into objects, uh, into it, we are using metaphor, um, using the power of metaphor in, in, in doing that. And then we, we see activities that are created out of making stories and telling stories as a, a good attribute or foundation to be, to, to, for that to be categorized as serious play. Um, and also when, when we start from an individual and it becomes a shared experience, um, a shared experience with uh, other, others in, in, in the group, then it is also serious play. Then we, we, then we move into um, role play and simulation where um, we answer the question of what if um, in building worlds that uh, may not be there. And then we, we see provocation when when you when you're sensorially um, challenged um, using your eyes your your senses um, your auditory your kinesthetic um, uh, you are provoked in, into that when it all it is also um, asking us to be spontaneous and be unpredictable um, it is serious play when lastly when we're solving problem uh, creatively uh, these are the attributes of um, serious play methods that we've encountered. So we have um, Lego serious play there, and these are human-centered qualities that, that, we, that we have. What, what has happened also is that um, we've looked at references in, in far and wide. Uh, uh, we've already heard from 
uh, Angela mentioning um, serious play from Michael Schrag. Uh, but also we'd like to like call out um, this book from Christiansen and Rasmussen, Building Better Business Using Lego Serious Play Method um, as also a, a, a good reference when you're looking at the, the bigger picture in serious play. Of course, we won't be talking about serious play if we don't um, reference the, the classic work of um, Dr. Stuart Brown uh, in his you know, classic book called Play. And it gives us a, a snapshot of the mind at play. These two books, uh, Innovation and Game Storming, we'll have a peek at that uh, later uh, after this slide. And just lastly, to round off um, some of the references that you, know, you might want to put in your library uh, when you are exploring serious play, there's Tinker Toys by Mikalko. Of course, De Bono would always be there uh, in your library. Uh, we've chosen or we, we gravitated towards how to have creative ideas by Edward de Bono. And we have two appearances from uh, Carl Kapp on Play to Learn and Gamification uh, Field Book. The last one, I must tell you, the Gamification of Learning and Instruction Field Book is quite hefty. <laughs> I have not yet finished uh, me going through it. But one interesting thing that is new in my library, at least, would be Jane McGonagall. Uh, looking at it from um, a futurist perspective, um, reality is broken, but she's narrowed it down to, uh, to game uh, and gamification. So let me just move on to that, as I shared and promised you. Uh, let's have a look at uh, an inside of game storming. This is primarily classic. When everyone talks about serious play or serious game, the, this book led by uh, Dave Gray um, is a reference for many facilitators or many people that are involved with, uh, with serious play or exploring it. If you look at it, there's about 80, 80 games within, within the book. And if we scroll down in some of, the, some of the activities that are there, these are familiar activities or serious games for us. And you might say, hey, there's a SWOT analysis there. Uh, Yep, and there's a racy matrix there. See, when we looked at the different serious play in the serious, serious game universe, and we uh, line it up with attributes that we mentioned a while ago, then these activities um, fall under serious play where also Lego serious play falls into place. Looking at the other book from Innovation Games by this one, I think Angela and I are like, wow, fantastic. In fact, I call this like the, yeah, here, there you go. She's flashing it. It's like, it's, it's hefty, but here's a snapshot of the almost like a dozen games there. I call this the meta games because you can infuse um, uh, changes to it and make it your own. In fact, one of my favorite uh, meta game from here is this uh, game called Speedboat. Um, primarily, I, I use this, for example, in design thinking when we're just starting um, and, and people are still, the team is still struggling with identifying what is really the problem and how do we go about it. And we're kind of like swimming with um, so many details. The way I would tweak it is like, instead of a speedboat, like it became a, a sailboat and, and all the metaphors that you can infuse in, into creating it, uh, creating a story around it and just crystallizing discussion at the beginning of the, the design thinking journey, this is quite helpful. Um, and you can also see some, um, some, some games, serious innovation games here, like buy a feature. I think you may have encountered that uh, quite recently um, in, in many of the design thinking projects that you have encountered, even 2020 vision. So have a go at um, this references, uh, the materials that we're sharing with you. I'm sure there are a thousand and one materials out there, but the idea is for us, um, Angela and I are, are trying to make sense of um, the things that we see their activities that are out there. And in fact, when you look at this screen, uh, I'm sharing with you it. I think I may need to just uh, make it a bit bigger for some. Yeah, there you go. So here is 
Angela and I attempting to make sense of all of this, um, all, all of these um, uh, activities. Uh, we, can, we can define the activity based on what it is strongest at. Like in LSP, for example, you, you, can, you can, of course, at this point, have an opinion of LSP in terms of its ability to create uh, great metaphors in story sharing. In, in, in if you encounter methods kit cards, for example, um, so for, for those that are unfamiliar, it's based out of Europe, if I'm not mistaken, really great, fascinating um, provocation cards um, in ideation. So there are so many applications, application bit, and if you scroll down, there, there are a few more. You caught us, you caught Angela and I are still trying to make sense of all of this. And, and as you can tell, serious play is, is a big world um, based on how we, we've been like um, uncovering all the possibilities of adapting serious play, not only in design thinking, but design in general and problem solving and long-term uh, long planning. Let me just quickly uh, shift to the other slide and just so you get a sense of how we think creating this, this matrix and layering on top of design thinking, um, then you, we can probably um, say, for example, if you are starting with your design thinking journey and, and you want uh, maybe a serious play or a serious game that you can consider for the interview portion at the beginning part, or which is the empathy stage of a design thinking, you can probably incorporate improv or role play into it. And when you, when you move into problem definition or problem reframing, why not use the visual explorer parts uh, into it? And then of course, when you move into um, the idea generation, this is, I think, um, there's a buffet, a smorgasbord of options of serious play and serious game. You, you can choose method kits, kit cards, of course, Lego Serious Play is, is strong, strong in, in, in that. Um, there are a few more that you have an option. Rory Story Cube, for example, you can still do that. Um, it is when you move into prototyping and validation that it sometimes becomes a bit uh, blurry in terms of how Serious Play and Serious Game can be applied. But in fact, when we, when we were exploring all of these other Serious Play and Serious Games, um, when you create low fidelity prototyping, wow, you, you actually are engaging your, um, your mind in, in terms of when you're developing prototype in a, in a playful manner. And lastly, when you're uh, at, the, at the stage of validating it with potential customers, um, you can incorporate improv and role play in, in, into it. Buy a feature, if you know this is uh, a an innovation game in that book that we just mentioned a while ago. So aside from, I think the main message at this point is that there is a big world outside of uh, Lego Serious Play. It is Serious Play and the, the idea of applying Serious Play into it. Hear me out uh, before you start playing with that. So the, the instruction here is quite simple. The six people that we have there on board, uh, I see you, oh yep, okay. So. The instruction is quite simple. Pick three icons that represents, or your, that represents an, an answer to my question, which is what will you do after this session? What mm -hmm. will you do after this session using three icons? Okay, so you have like 30 them, seconds to pick. You pull them away? Yeah, pull them away, like what I'm gonna do. Um, I'm choosing one, and then this one, and this is my uh, story icon from what I will do after this session. So go for it. I see mm. things moving, Gretel is moving. George is still thinking. Dying limb is there now. Okay. Don't overthink. Have a look. It's just a fun way of incorporating a, an activity prior to what could be a very heavy discussion on a lot of things. Um, I think in the interest of time, um, I'll probably ask uh, us to just stop what we're, yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. yeah. And then um, at this point, it, it's really a matter of sharing uh, the story around the three 
the concept you've chosen. So I think I see guest designer in this instance fully complete. So may we ask a uh, guest designer to come in and probably just a quick share on what this, these three icons represent. Well, what about, let's pick on Jog. Mm. I mean, you, these, these George? three here, because George. Where is George? You're unmuted, go. Yeah. Mr. Malaysia. Hi. Hello. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I couldn't unmute myself, so that's why. Sorry. Um, yeah, okay. thanks uh, for giving me this opportunity. So uh, my icons are on the right. It's a bicycle, a Google sign, like a, a dartboard, like a focus thing. So um, I have, I've never really witnessed or experienced Lego serious play, but I've heard about it from both of you guys at uh, Play 14 last year. So I was yep. curious about it. Uh, so that's a bit like the focus. Now I'm a bit more focused and actually I have some questions as well because I'm very interested in it and I would like to learn more about it. Um, then the Google sign is also to do a bit more Googling after this, also especially, <laughs> uh, especially yep. the book Darwin talked about. Uh, mm. I wrote it down, Game Storming from O'Reilly. So I'll see if I can uh, find it and uh, uh, yeah, get some more information there. Cool. Right, cool. And, uh, yeah, the bicycle is, I'm, I'm a Dutchman, so a bicycle always uh, relates mm -hmm. to me, and I come by bike to work, so later uh, today I will cycle back. So I just thought cool. that one has to be in as well. Yeah. Awesome. And just, yeah, and just to round up that experience, it's more of like, we, we, make, we make it a, a bit more gamified by having a contest and by voting on the, the most interesting, uh, most interesting uh, story that has been shared. I think we, Angela, just That's it, right? checking on Vanya. Yeah. yeah, I think just the last one really just maybe round off on why I play in design thinking. And then I think we can go to uh, Q&A after that. Okay, yep. Sorry, let me just... Yep, and, and it's really why play. I mean, I mean, at this point, I think I may rephrase it. And why serious play and why design thinking? Serious play, you know, this enriches uh, a very humdrum kind of activity in, with, with work which is what we normally associate, play is fun. Why not incorporate fun into our daily lives and where we were connecting teams, um, building trust. Um, that's the you know, bedrock of, of, of play. And when we look at it from a problem solving perspective, it just unlocks creativity and opens a lot of you know, new perspective or directions when we start discussing in the context or, or in the, around play. And yeah, this is like, I, I, I tell, I tell everyone in terms of when you're in the state of flow, um, when you are at play, um, this is where you are at your best. Um, and just yeah. having play just energizes you and engages you um, yeah. when, when you incorporate play into that one. And then Great. maybe Darwin, if you could just move on to the miss the Mentimeter, let's move on to the next one. I just wanted to say, this is really sort of the close yeah. of our um, seminar on serious play. I'll let Narita talk about Q&A in a second, but if you are interested in knowing a bit more and go in depth, this has obviously been a lightning speed quick. Um, we mm. are running a program early September um, and I have a link to Eventbrite if you're keen to look at it a little bit further. We've already got some Ministry of Education folks signed up, so we're super excited for that. But uh, that's us. Narita, over to you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angela and Darwin, for making a three-hour session happen in 50 minutes. I'm not sure how you got it done, <laughs> but <laughs> virtual LSP is the way forward. So big thanks for that. Um, so we've got obviously, um, we've got a chat box going. If you've got any questions like you're just kind of put in a box, we'll try to direct as many questions as we can towards them. Um, but we kind of maybe, you know, for those who obviously seen the breakout sessions, we hope you got a taster for what that experience is all about. Um, so we're going to maybe just start off our first question directed to Angela um, first, as we kind of see through the questions that are going to come through uh, shortly. So the first one would be uh, question one. What are some of the benefits of serious play compared to traditional um, engagement workshops? Angela? Yeah. 
So I think the thing about workshops, we know people have got their smart devices, they've got multiple things going on in their minds and multitasking. And I think the thing about serious play is you really cannot multitask. You know, when you're playing Lego and you're building with these bricks, quite frankly, it's the only thing that you're doing. And I think for me, it's one of the big benefits besides the fact, obviously, that you get breakthrough thinking and people are able to unlock new knowledge. For me, the big thing is that people are present they lean in, they really co-create and contribute, and there's nothing else that's really going on in their world. So for me, that's the big, big, big difference. Thank you, Angela. Um, um, so for this LSP methodology, Darwin, um, mm -hmm. how is it, when is it best adopted? Is it good for employee engagement? Is it good for design thinking? Or if you're trying to do leadership visioning and you got guys in suits, does it work? Yeah. So when can we use it? When is it appropriate? Oh, wow. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer and a big fan of Lego Serious Play as part of Serious Play. Um, I employ Serious Play, Lego Serious Play, in so many ways um, whenever it is applicable. So if I'm, for example, uh, in a service design challenge, um, we're creating a new one. LSP is there at the beginning of the, the journey when we're trying to unravel and untangle the question that they have. In, even in visioning, like when you have strategic planning uh, or scenario creation, Lego series play comes into play, pun intended, <laughs> pun intended in, that, in that aspect. So um, think of Lego series play as a fairly good meta game that you can incorporate meaning into it and you can extract a lot of value in it for so long as you know what it is that you are trying to address. Okay, so one interesting question that just came up from CISA was a very interesting one direct to you, Angela. Can LSP mm. be used to create advertisement campaigns? Ah, interesting. I wanna say because in the, the sort of creation of communications, there's a couple steps that happen, right? And the first step is really understanding who's this communication for and what's our sort of best uh, foot forward in terms of messaging. And I think LSP is very good at defining what those parameters are up front. So getting agreement, you know, I worked in the advertising industry, not 20 years, like Narita said, <laughs> but just 13 years. And one of our biggest challenges was always, what is the communication got to say and what's it got to do for whom? And often we would come up with the, with the campaigns and then we'd learn something later about what we really wanted to do. And the client would sometimes say, well, no, that's not what we meant. And I wish I'd had Lego series play back then because I think it clarify the brief really, really well up front. So I'm not sure it can create the ads, but it definitely can set the conditions to get the strategy right. Awesome. Thank you. I've got like so many good questions coming up. I see yeah. so many good ones. Um, we're going to address the questions maybe after when people kind of sure. have to log off at 11.30. Um, mm, and yeah. so for the purpose of timing, I'd like to maybe yeah. just pass the time over to Paul Selvaraj from Design Singapore to kind of give us updates um, in the play theme topic. Thank you, Narita. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. And thank you very much, Angela and Darwin, for that awesome serious play uh, segment. Really enjoyed that. So maybe let me just introduce myself. My name is Paul Salvaraj from the Design Singapore Council. And I mean, it's my great pleasure to actually introduce you to the council in this five to 10 minute segment, and also actually go through some of the programs uh, that we are, you know, we are, we are bringing out and that would be of great relevance to you. So uh, Design Singapore Council is actually the national agency of design in Singapore. And you know, our role and our vision actually is for Singapore to be an innovation driven economy and a lovable city by design by 2025, right? And our mission is also, you know, developing the design sector. What we mean by that is not only do we want to focus on, you know, the traditional design fields like fashion design, furniture design, we're also all about the emerging fields of design like service design, experience design, and even serious play as well, which uh, Angela and Darwin mentioned. And, you know, we're always on the lookout to help Singapore use design and innovation for uh, the future. As you can tell, um, I mean, that's something that's sorely needed as we navigate through these difficult times. And lastly, uh, making life better through, this, through design by designing for different individuals and different people. 
So I, I was really interested in breakout group, group one to actually listen to all the different stories I heard and all the different responses. And uh, I think two things which I took away was the very keen aspect on storytelling, which I thought everyone nailed mm. very well, as well as something around putting the user at the center of all conversations. And I think I would actually like you to, to uh, sort of get these two aspects in your mind as we go forward and, and talk about the program. So uh, Design Singapore actually has come up with this program called Design for Business User Journey Mapping, right? About improving experiences for customers by understanding users better. So uh, as we heard about storytelling, as we heard about, uh, you know, envisioning things through Lego, we were actually thinking, you know, this storytelling component could be a good way in actually visualizing your entire end-to-end -end user journey through sort of like a user journey map. So I think Darwin went through that in quite length as well. And um, we usually think that this is a good first step for com companies to actually try and adopt um, thinking through their user's lens as well as empathizing with their users. Yeah. So a typical example of a journey map would be something like this where we go through an end-to-end -end process of, let's say, a customer journey. In this case, through an online grocery store, which I think everyone has experience with. And we look through what the customer says, what the customer does, even what the customer thinks and feels as he goes through the entire journey, as well as, you know, maybe identifying areas of improvement throughout the journey of where we could actually innovate and improve on. So this is intended to be a very sort of a quick and fast way to actually quickly come up with that full end-to-end -end journey and uh, get everyone on the same page of what your customer is doing. So customer journey maps comes in all shapes and sizes. It depends very much on the person or the designer who's going through the entire process. And what we find is that it's a very quick way for uh, people to come together to, to sort of take stock of their existing customer experience and improve that as it goes on. So, uh, I mean, no doubt, undoubtedly, user journey mapping has actual tangible benefits. Um, identifying your user's pain points and actually uh, thinking of ways to improve that is uh, a very, very big factor in this process. And I guess the numbers speak for itself. This would be the main slide for everyone to actually take note of. Our user journey mapping program comes in three different options. So we have option one and option two, which is on user journey mapping of your customers, identifying areas of pain points, and also identifying some personas, right? Your hypothetical sort of user archetypes that you can actually focus on. And uh, you can enjoy an 80% subsidy across all three options uh, until the end of 2020. And the final one would be uh, around service blueprinting. So that's slightly different. If I could just give a quick analogy of service blueprinting, we have the front stage, which is your customer interaction, and you have your backstage. So the things happening behind the scenes, we believe that if you optimize your backstage, your front stage also sort of gets the benefit as well. And we try not to look at uh, customer journey separately in that, in that aspect. Oh, cool. Uh, I would, I would very much like to thank Angela Darwin again for that great uh, session. And thank you. you can uh, indicate your interest in the sure. schemes by scanning the QR code on the left, or you could actually uh, find out more about the options Design Singapore is hosting uh, as we move forward. And thank you again, and over to you, Narita. All right. Thank you, everyone. We're just three minutes past 11.30. Thank you so much for your participation. We hope you gained some insights from today's session. Uh, big thanks and round of applause for, for the entire kind of collaborative team who's tried to make this, who's made this happen. So just on that, thank you everyone for your participation. We are going to try and address some of the questions that's popped up in the, the chat box that came up earlier. Yeah. So for those of you yeah. who sent it, you want to stay on, you're more than welcome to. Uh, but to everyone else who needs to go with on with their busy Friday afternoon, have a lovely day and thank again. Thank you again for joining us. Yeah. Thanks guys. Thanks also yeah. to the paper space folks for yep. hosting this and doing all the back of house uh, <laughs> organizing. We really appreciate it. There's a lot of hands behind the scenes of course. Uh, making this happen. And of course, 
Design Singapore to Zeth and team, uh, Paul, Michelle from Design Singapore Council. Thank you so much. I'm going to stay on the call for a little bit um, uh, because likewise. I've got nothing else to do on a Friday. Um, <laughs> and so if you want to stay and have a little chat, we can. But obviously it is 10, sorry, 11.35 and mm. we've kept you five minutes long. Sorry. All right. Thanks, Angela. So while the, the kind of survey feedback is happening, I'm just going to go through some of the, the questions that I thought were, were really interesting. Mm. Um, first one was after that ad question. Let me find that question. Way yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Would LSP yeah. be relevant for a team building and team culture building purpose? Um, and do you want to tackle Question? No, I think Darwin is a good is perfect for this one. Okay. <laughs> yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> when when you when you bring a, a team, especially a newly formed team, um, be bringing them into an environment of play uh, creates that bond uh, quite quickly, which is the objective of what you're trying to do in any team building exercise, right? Um, what is it that they said? Um, bring me an hour, get me into an hour of play and I will know you more or better. Um, and that's what um, brings out play. Uh, you get to know yourself, you get to know your team quite quickly. Yeah. And, and so LSP, add, yes. yes. I'll just add to that. Basically, Lego series play as a methodology is a, it creates dialogue. Mm -hmm. And so you know, dialogue is sorely lacking. And I think, you know, one of the challenges that we're experiencing today with, um, you know, going through all of the challenges of COVID-19 and business continuity is how do we bring people together and how do we kind of like figure out what's, what's happening next? And I think Lego Series Play is really good at that, to bring people together, to let people have a voice and to bring them into the conversation about what kind of company we want to be because maybe there's having to be a big reset around our focus. Um, so yeah, very good for alignment around vision, value, mm -hmm. strategy. Um, and of course, new ideas uh, as well. So it's, it's quite a flexible system. Yeah. Okay. There's a next question from Bharat, I think, and it's a good question. Yeah. It seems like a good approach of, to disrupt pattern thinking but can it be used for a more defined challenge? Yes. So you want to, you want to define challenge. You want to have like, it, it works really well when you have a particular area of inquiry where you're trying to understand, I don't know, what's, uh, you know, what's our next move as an organization. It can be very defined. Um, you want to obviously leave it sufficiently open that you're going to invite people to bring their thoughts and feelings into the workshop. And so I would say where it doesn't work so well is where you have an agenda and you want to tell people something and you want to tell them to think something. And I think that's where it's a little tricky when you use it uh, to force something on people. Um, it needs to, you know, live to the values of Lego series play, which is that there's vast untapped potential sitting around us. And um, we need to elicit though that feedback into the process. Um, so a focus is helpful. Um, are we thinking about next year's plan? Are we thinking about a particular customer, a particular market, or even a product, one product that we want to like rethink? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I think that's where, um, when it becomes serious rather than display, mm -hmm. if you have an, an, an aim or an idea that a, a defined challenge, um, then it becomes serious play because there is a point where you're just playing. Um, and it's an unstructured and free flow. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Any more, this Narita? A question from Vivian. Um, it says it's an interesting question where uh, during the sharing session, I would like to hear more about whether the workshop participants um, changed um, in terms of ex true experiences and cases. I'm not, I'm not sure if Vivian's with us, but what sort of change were you maybe referring to? Point of view, behavior, culture. Uh, were you seeing some of that, Angela, with our, our crazy yes. with you? Yes. No, I think um, the real success is when, you know, when we go to a meeting, 
often when we know the agenda of that meeting and we know what we're trying to do, we can actually go in with a script. Mm. You know, we go in knowing our point of view and we want to hit our point of view across. Lego Series Play tries to sort of disrupt that script. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to move people either in understanding what's, what, what situation do we find ourselves in? How do we as an organization need to change because of this new situation? And so it helps to sort of shift people to see maybe another perspective. Um, and so, yes, I mean, the objective is to, for people to leave that workshop changed in some way by having some kind of eureka maybe, mm -hmm. um, some new understanding. And of course, ultimately in LEGO Series Play, you want to make sure that there's some action you know, where do we take this? Um, so, yeah, I think definitely people walk away, hopefully, a little bit, um, a little bit uh, shifted in some way. Transformed. Okay. <laughs> There's one last question from Rachel. It's really interesting because I had her question resides with me, having worked with mm. lots of corporates. Um, ha has there been any opportunity to work with top-tier consulting firms like McKinsey, uh, to use LSP to engage top management on strategy sessions. Um, have you had any experiences um, of similar uh, setups? Yes. Well, mm -hmm. I know that it's used extensively with senior leadership. And yep. um, I have, in fact, I've had CEOs in my session. And I know that the big consultancies are actually toying with Lego Series Play. Um, yep. We in our community, Darwin, we've got some folks from like Deloitte and KPMG mm. and Boston yep. Consulting Group. So they are dabbling in it. Mm -hmm. um, I think culturally, it may not be a perfect fit for those typical sort of management consultancies, but some are seeing the light. Yep. And it works very well, I think, with senior leaders who can be a bit too much in their head sometimes. Mm. Um, and it's, it's a, such a great equalizer, you know, when you have the CEO in the room sitting yeah. alongside one of his managers building and sharing. And you know what? Everyone gets the same airtime. Mm. So nobody can, no one can dominate the conversation. Um, I know that when I talk with clients and we commission projects, often they say, you know, how is it going to be having the CEO or the leadership team in the room? And I always say, it's great because they're, they're there listening they're part of the dialogue. It's very important. So, yeah. yes, definitely done with senior leaders. And I would say, that actually, they need it more because they really do need to get out of their own heads. <laughs> Absolutely, Angela. And having sort of facilitated the session last March, I think some of the feedback we got from participants is very interesting, is that it's, it's non-judgmental. Mm -hmm. So certain questions in certain workshops, you kind of have to have to prime yourself with the perfect answer. There yep. is no perfect answer and there are no wrong answers in LSP. So whatever yeah, yeah. you do is as good as the next person because it's your point of view and it's a safe space to do that. Yeah. Um, so I think I, just on that point, Narita, yeah. I remember I think telling you the market in the world where Lego series play has the greatest demand. In other words, where are the most facilitators outside of North America, um, which is it, it, because it's had a long history, is actually in Japan. And there's a good reason for that. And that is because the methodology allows frank conversations that can be quite difficult. Yes. And definitely very difficult in very hierarchical organizations and hierarchical cultures where juniors are afraid to speak up, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Lego Series Play is the ultimate sort of equalizer. Yeah. yeah. It's, your uh, metaphor, your story making and storytelling comes in, into play. But I think I wanted, what I want to also add on in Lego Series Play, I think what I like is the persistence of the memory that you build when, when you are doing LEGO Series Play. I can come back to an organization after a year and they will still refer to the model by heart and will point to the different bricks because of the different meanings that have, become, that have been shared and has been communicated to the organization. So the, the, the persistence of the memory that you make when you're playing lingers on and there's a, a tangible model in, in, on hand. So this is a very good last question. I can't see your name here, but it kind of ends everything really well, which is, um, you know, when you look at when I have the same problem as well, when I try to put it to clients, they're like, that's great for everyone else but ourselves. Um, so how do you kind of, um, maybe there is a question, and the question is, you know, uh, 
you know, what about how do you address discomfort of participants who are not comfortable with play in a work mm. setting? And I think that's a very valid question. Or feel that participating in LSP is too unstructured? Mm. <laughs> Good question. Mm. Yeah. I haven't met anyone who doesn't want to play, but, but I understand yep. the cultural sort of, you know, workplace context that might sort of feel out of place. Mm-hmm. The thing what we do, Darwin, is we do these demo sessions with clients. Exactly, yes. Um, You have to put people in a room and you have to show how it works and and create comfort around the bricks Mm -hmm. and building and, more importantly, the significance um, and the productive output that comes from the building. Comes out of it. So so I feel like that's um, that's a big one. Um, we always have to tell people it's serious play. It's not play. Yep. yep. And the serious bit um, is really that there's some heavy thinking going on. Um, and, you know, I think when I'm talking to a client and they are sort of worried, they're, they're both sides, right? The one is that um, it's too playful. Mm, then mm. you have to, play up the fact that actually this this is serious and there's a huge structure. And and the reason why Darwin and I are sort of have done the certifications is because the designing of the questions is really important and designing of what is the outcome, right? And we we would spend hours brainstorming sort of what's the best Mm. journey you want to create. So it's highly structured. It's not just a whole bunch of bricks, right, Darwin? I mean, Definitely yeah, not. No, I, I so totally agree with you. And I think it's that reinforcement of what you mentioned earlier uh, when you were answering Narita's uh, question. I mean, in, in, for that one. I think it's one thing for us to tell you about LSP, but it is also one other thing for you to experience it yourself before you form an opinion. Because only when you play it, uh, mm-hmm. even with just a, a few short minutes, I mean, we went through like 20 minutes with, with just that. And um, I am looking at the comments in the chat. I was like forming ideas and, and opinions already on that. So, yeah, um, I, I so agree. And who doesn't love this kind of things yeah. when it's already like Play. there in front of you? Yeah. I mean, we have the best job in the world when we bring exactly. people into a room and there's yep. a pile of bricks on the table. I mean, yeah. you know, my life is not terrible. Um, and um, people sort of the energy changes we are done mm. a huge favor when they see the bricks but then the real work starts and I always tell people it's not balloons and high-fiving and fun 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 <laughs> yeah. um, um, I have my I have got my German roots and I'm all business um, <laughs> and it's all about like let's get going and let's get the output and so it's very output driven it's very structured um, yeah. it's serious yeah. And I get a and I get a lot of um after they've gone through it, it's like, hey Darwin, that was really exhausting. Fulfilling but exhausting. It was like they were not expecting it to be that way. I mean, you know, serious play. There is still the play. Yeah, we were, they were in the flow yeah. of doing that. But yeah. then they, when they they tell me like, oh, it's like I went to therapy or I'm too exhausted now. <laughs> like, oh wow. Then it just tells you how um powerful serious play in general could be yeah absolutely so ladies and gentlemen it is 11 48 i have another call it's been <laughs> fantastic i don't understand bye why bye everyone with us but thank you so much That's for joining fantastic today. um hey guys reach time. out on linkedin yeah thank you very thanks, much Rita. thanks, thanks Rita. Darwin. thanks everybody thanks, thanks everyone bye see you on have linkedin bye yeah.